message on my heart. I'm looking forward to preaching it to you. 2 Samuel 17, 2 uh, Samuel, 1 Samuel, I should say, 1 Samuel. I believe I gave the wrong, I got the wrong uh, on my notes, all right, but it's 1 Samuel. So just ignore that too. It's a one. I'll, uh, hopefully that won't be too many mistakes. I, I'm, a, I'm about half out of it. But I'll, get, I'll be all right here in a minute once I get started. If the Lord lay his hand on me, I'll be all right. If he don't, uh, this will be quick, all right, and we'll go home and go to bed. But I want to, if I can, preach to you um, uh, the message I preached last night. Now, I was, uh, our, our, our young people are having a wonderful time down at Galilee Baptist Church in Monroe, North Carolina, with Andy Wells, dear friend of mine. He's been doing teen camps for a number of years. And uh, when we came off the mission field in 2006, we started taking our teens over there every year. And for the eight years we were at Pleasant View, we took our teens over there to Galilee. Then when we came up here, um, we said something about it. And I thought it might be too far, but we've been taking our young people down there for a number of years. And I was telling somebody just the other day that for the eight years that we were at Pleasant View, my wife and I took the young people to teen camp, slept in the dorms, in the bunk beds with all the kids, and went out there and did all the activities in that heat. And then we came here, and we did it here as well for about the first five or six years we were here. But thanks be unto God, for the last two years, I've been able to delegate some of that stuff and watch Brother Leader out there cooking in the sun and Brother Adriel out there cooking in the sun. And I'm sitting in the shade drinking sweet tea saying, y'all doing good. <laughs> but uh, we come in at night and all the young people are there and they break them up into four teams. That way everybody's not in their little cliques and they're all having to meet new, new people. And some really good churches are represented there. Dear preacher friends of mine, it's always good to see them and fellowship with them while all of our young people get to interact. And, and they've got a great setup. They have preaching in the morning, a uh, message or two, and then they go outside and play and have all kinds of activities. Um, yesterday, yesterday, they had softball and skeet shooting and volleyball. Everybody got to shoot the shotgun at least twice, some of them that wanted to shoot more. And I'm going to tell you something right now. Our teen girls are, are Annie Oakley's. I will never forget Addison. She turned around. She said, that's how we roll in Dundalk. She shot. Pull. Just pulverize that ski. Pull. She turned around. She said, that's how we roll in Dundalk. I said, yeah, buddy. Whatever you do when you go visit her, you better knock before you go in. Amen. You look like you broke out with a chicken pox if you don't. They're having a ball, having a ball. And, uh, and then they come in and a lot of praying, a lot of Bible memorization, but just a lot of fun. It's a good balance of activities and spiritual uh, stuff and activities. And then the food's been great. But then we come in at night and they do a combined choir. Everybody that wants to sing in the choir. So they all, that choir loft is just jam packed. And Gabrielle is shaking her head. That was one of the highlights of teen camp was hearing those kids up there singing. And Brother Michael Lindsay leading, Brother Payne's on the piano. And I was over in the corner playing the bass guitar on Monday night and God gave me this message while I was up there playing the guitar, looking at all those young people. Boy, God laid this message on my heart. And Brother Bill, I was looking at my notebook. My notebook and my pen and my Bible was on the other end of the pew. And I was thinking, boy, if I, if I don't write this down, I'm going to forget it. God was just, it was like sitting in front of a fire hydrant. It was just coming at me. And uh, so God gave me this message Monday night during, during the song service. And I didn't even know if I would preach or not. I assumed I might if I could. But he asked me to preach it last night. And God used it. And uh, I, saw, I said, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to back up and preach it again uh, to everybody that didn't get to hear it. And I want to focus on these young people tonight. So hopefully you're in 1 Samuel chapter number 17. Did I ever give you the, the chapter? 1 Samuel 17. I've got the wrong reference on the slides. Don't worry about that. I'm just going to read a couple of verses here. And then we're going to jump right into this message. The whole message is not out of this chapter this is, I'm going to take my text from here. We're going to look at a couple other places tonight. And I'm going to try to move quick because i got six points and I'm tired. But I want to give you this tonight because I hope it will help somebody. Six points. When I say I'm going to preach fast, y'all just all get comfortable, kick your shoes off. I know. I can see y'all back there laughing. <clears throat> 1 Samuel 17. 
Verse number 29, David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? This is a chapter on the David and Goliath, my, one of my favorite stories in the whole Bible. The Bible says in verse 30, he turned from him towards another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him, thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Look at verse 33, young people. And then Saul said to David, thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For thou art but a youth, and he, a man of war, from his youth. I want to preach for a little bit tonight on this thought right here. They will say you can't. Amen. They will say you can't, but you can Lord, help us tonight, I pray, as we look in the scriptures, bring these verses back to our remembrance, and I pray, Lord, that you allow us to be able to draw some truth from this message. Give me strength and give me liberty and give me power tonight, I pray, to preach. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to begin tonight by saying that there's nothing quite as amazing and quite as priceless as having somebody that believes in you. I want you young people to listen to me tonight. Look at me. You're in a place tonight where there's people that believe in you. You're in a place tonight where there's a pastor that believes in you. I wouldn't have brought you in here tonight. I wouldn't have had you sit down here in the front and had your Bible in your lap where I could preach to you eyeball to eyeball if I did not believe in you tonight. If I didn't think you had a chance if I didn't think you could do something for God, I wouldn't have brought you in here tonight. There's people in here, your teachers, your parents, many of you, most of you, your parents would fall into that category that they believe in you. Now here at Calvary Baptist Church, we run buses on Sunday morning. And it's heartbreaking to see many times the children that on their own will make the effort to come to church without their parents without their parents encouraging them to, without their parents bringing them, without their parents dropping them off, without their parents coming and sitting beside them. And I'm afraid that many of our young people in our communities don't really have anybody around them that believes in them. If they did, they seem like they would be more people investing in them and making uh, uh, the effort to influence them. But I wanna tell you young people tonight, you're in a place that believes in you. We believe, I believe, that you can experience a relationship with God at your age. Now, a lot of people won't tell you that. In fact, this whole message is quite the opposite. Most of the people that you will encounter in your life, not just now, but on up when you get my age and older, most of the people around you will look at you and say to you exactly what Saul said to David right here, you're not able, you can't do it. You got too many things against you. Your family dynamic, your, your, uh, your family, your home, your, your mama, your daddy, whoever they are, and, and where you live, and, and what your talents might be, and what your gifts might be, and, and what your intellectual level might be. They'll throw everything at you and give you all these reasons why you can't. But you can. The reason why I say that tonight is because there's a group of people in the Bible, and all of them was young people. And as I began to look at this list of people God laid on my heart Monday night, I was amazed at how many of these young people had somebody in their life telling them, you can't, you're not able. And every single one of them did it. We've got young people sitting here tonight. There is no telling, there's absolutely no telling what God can do with you. There's no telling what God's plan for your life is. He's not gonna tell you what his plan is for your life right now. His plan for your life right now is for you to obey your mom and daddy. His plan for your life right now is for you to get in that Bible and read that Bible and memorize that Bible and spend some time every day on your knees talking to God. His plan for you right now is to listen to the training and the instruction that you're receiving from those people in your life that God has put there to, to teach you and exhort you and admonish you. Your, God's plan for your life is to live every day doing exactly those things that you know you're supposed to do. And you keep doing that. And one of these days, he's gonna open up the windows and he's gonna let you see the big picture. And you don't know when that's gonna be. 
I know some preachers that were called to preach at an early age. I know some missionaries that were called to the mission field at an early age. I don't know what God's plan for your life is, but I can promise you one thing. God has a plan. God has a purpose. And there's gonna be people all around you, the devil's gonna make sure of it, that there's people all around you looking at you every day and saying to you in some way, shape, or form, you can't. You're not able. But you are able. And with God, you can and I want to give you a list of them tonight, right out of the word of God. First of all, in our text tonight, we see the story of David and Goliath. If you're taking notes, write this down. Number one, there will be people that will say you cannot defeat superior powers. In this story, David shows up to give his brothers cheese and bread and corn and he goes up there and he finds out Goliath's been bringing reproach and defiling God and, and uh, he's been... He's been uh, uh, just absolutely uh, wrecking havoc with the morale of the people of Israel. And for 40 days, this has been going on. And I've preached this chapter so many times about got it memorized, but David shows up and he's absolutely blown away that nobody is fighting this giant. And David says, what will happen to the man that fights this giant? And they said, well, he'll get this and he'll get this and he'll get this and he'll get this. And then they found out he was asking questions and his brother Eliab got mad at him and he looked at his brother and said, is there not a cause? And word trickled back to the king. And the king asked for David to come. And of course, David is just a young lad at this point. We don't know exactly what his age was, but I think he was probably somewhere in his teens, all right? And so he shows up and he says to Saul, he said, let no man's heart fail because of him. I will go and I will fight this Philistine, this giant. And here's exactly what Saul said. You're not able. You're not able. I'm glad David didn't listen to Saul. Here's what Saul said. You can't fight him because he's bigger than you. He's bigger than you. He's older than you. He's stronger than you. He's more experienced than you. He's got more education. He's got better equipment. He's got all these things going for him. You're just a little boy with a sling. There is no way in the world that you can defeat this superior power. But he did. And here's what I realized. I realized that throughout your life, starting right now and all the way up to you get old and die, nearly everybody that you interact with in some way, shape, or form is probably gonna have an advantage over you. They may have more money. They may have a better job. They may have had a better education. They may have a better skill set. They may be older. They may be smarter according to the world. They may have all these things and what's gonna happen if you're not careful is you're gonna live your life as a Christian with an inferiority complex feeling there's no way in the world I can go up against these people because they got this and this and this and this. But the truth of the matter is you don't need all that stuff. All you need is God. Oh, you need God. That's what David said to Saul. Uh, 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 Goliath, he said, I come to you in the name of the Lord. He was so, Saul was so embarrassed to fight this boy that the Bible says in verse number 42 that the Philistine looked about and saw David and he disdained him. Disdain. That word literally means to belittle, to look down on. Some of you know what that feels like. Some of you know what it feels like when all the kids are picking teams. They're picking teams and you got two captains and they say, I'll take him. And the other one says, I'll take her. The other one says, I'll take him. The other one says, I'll take him. And you watch all the big athletes and all the able-bodied people get picked and they get down and all you got there at the end is the few little people that nobody wants on their team. And you're sitting there going, man, I wish they'd give me a chance. That's what disdain feels like. David had dealt with this day in his whole life. It started way back a couple chapters before where the man of God showed up and told Jesse, God's going to anoint one of your sons to be king today. Get all your boys in here, line them up. Bring them all in the living room. Line them all up. We're going to anoint one of your boys to be king of Israel. And he didn't even think enough of David to go get him out of the field. Left him down there watching the sheep. And Samuel went down through that list, uh, that, that, that line of boys, starting with Eliab, and he went on right down, that, that, and he looked around, and the Holy Ghost said, that ain't none of them. And he looked at Jesse, and he says, do you have any more sons? He said, well, yeah, David's out there watching the sheep. And Samuel said, I don't want nobody to sit down. Don't even get comfortable. Pull up a chair. We're going to stand right here until he gets here. And when he walked in the door, the Holy Ghost said, that's him. 
That's him. Nobody even thought he was important enough to even consider. They didn't even give him enough consideration to be able to be rejected. Think about that just a minute. They didn't think enough of him to even bring him in the room and let him get passed over. He'd been dealing with this thing for a long time. And the Bible tells us in chapter number 17 and in verse number, uh, uh, verse, uh, verse number uh, chapter number 16 rather, and in verse number 21, David came to Saul, stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And he played his harp for Saul. David has been a blessing to Saul, playing his harp. He'd been out there practicing in the fields, under the trees, playing to the sheep, playing to God. And now he's got an opportunity to play in the palace and he's playing his harp. And the Bible says that God would take that music, take that music ministry that David had and take that evil spirit away from Saul and replace it with a good spirit. And David loved Saul and he became his armor bearer. And then they went to battle in chapter number 17 and didn't think enough of him to even take him to battle with them. They sent him on back down to the pasture to watch the sheep, according to chapter 17 and verse number 15. The Bible says David was the youngest and the three eldest followed Saul, but David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep. They didn't even take him to battle. He was armor bearer for the king. Nobody thought he was good at anything. Nobody thought he was important. Nobody thought he could do anything. And when he volunteered to go and fight Goliath, the very word Saul said is, you're not able the crazy thing is there was a whole army of soldiers and a king that was head and shoulders taller than everybody else and apparently they weren't able either. But guess what? David was able. And we don't have time to read this whole chapter. I got a bunch of other stuff I want to look at. But if you'll look in chapter number 17, the Bible says in verse number of 49, David put his hand in his bag, took thence a stone and slang it, smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David, watch this, prevailed over the Philistine. He was able to defeat a superior power when everybody around him said you can't, he did. Amen. There'll be times in your life when you've got a battle that you've got to fight and it looks like there's no way in the world you can win. But with God, you can do it. Amen. Don't let anybody tell you you can't. You can. Yeah. If God will do it for David, he'll do it for you. Yeah. Second one I want to look at tonight is a man by the name of Joseph in Genesis chapter number 37. In Genesis chapter number 37, we love, I love the story of Joseph. He's one of my heroes in the Bible. There are so many wonderful things about Joseph's life, and we could have preached the whole message probably and never left the life of Joseph. I'm, it's a bit scattered tonight, but I want you to look at this right here. The Bible tells us in verse number 5 of Genesis 37, Joseph dreamed a dream and told it to his brethren, and they hated him. Yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed, for behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said unto him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet, verse nine, another dream and told it to his brethren and said, behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars made obeisance to me. Look at verse 10, he told it to his father and to his brethren and his father rebuked him. Write this down, number two. They will say, you can't dream special plans for your life. Joseph's laying in the bed. He's just laying in the bed. And God's giving him all these dreams. God's putting things into his mind that nobody else put there but God. I mean, where in the world would you come up with the idea of a bunch of sheaves of wheat bowing down to another sheaf of wheat? Where would you ever get the idea of the sun and the moon and a bunch of stars bowing to another star? I mean, that's crazy. But while he was asleep, he had things in his heart, things in his mind that God put there and he began to dream. And basically what he did, he got next morning and he went to the breakfast table and he said, y'all ain't gonna believe this. God put some things in my heart. When I grow up, I wanna do something special. I wanna do something amazing. I want to do something that's never been done before in this family. I want to do something that's never been done before. And they looked at him and they said, you're not able. You can't do that. 
In fact, daddy said, I want you to stop talking. You can't talk like that. I don't want to hear no more about it. His brothers hated him so bad for his dreams. The Bible tells us in verse 19 that when they saw him afar off, they said, behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, verse 20, let us slay him and cast him into some pit and we will say some evil beast hath devoured him. Watch this. And we shall see what will become of his dreams. See, they didn't like the fact that their little brother was dreaming big special things that they didn't care about. They didn't like it that he had dreams and he had ambitions and he had plans that was different from theirs. And so instead of encouraging him and saying, well, hey, who knows, maybe one day God might do something amazing in your life. Who knows, maybe one day God might put his hand on you and let you save a whole nation from starvation. God might let you save the whole world from starvation. God might let you uh, uh, interpret the dreams of a Pharaoh one day. No, they all looked at him and they hated him. And his daddy said, stop talking, I don't wanna hear it. You can't talk like that. You can't dream like that. Is everybody still with me? I hope you adults are listening because this applies to y'all too. I got to thinking about, I got to thinking about Sister Brittany Young. A bus kid at my wife's brother's church, Brother Ronnie Young's church down at Morning Star, bus kid with a family that was so dysfunctional she couldn't even live at home, she had to live with her grandma. And that, that household was dysfunctional. Her daddy got shot and killed sitting out in his pickup truck one night out in his yard and it's still an unsolved murder to this day. They have no idea what happened. And her mama, help me out, Miss Grace, she was told she, 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 uh, she had never had anything to do with her mama. She didn't have a relationship with her mama. She lived with her grandma. And her chicks, she'd come home sometime from church and all of her clothes would be thrown out in the yard. <laughs> Bus kid, sitting on the pew, morning star Baptist church. But God put something inside of her. She wanted more. That ain't what she wanted for her family. That ain't what she, how she wanted to live. She wanted to break that cycle. She began to dream of God putting his hand on her and using her and doing something with her in her life that had never been done before in her family. And what do you know? God allowed her dream to come true. She ended up marrying the pastor's son, Brother Preston, and then God called him to preach and put him pastor in Sweet Home Baptist Church. And now Brittany is a pastor's wife with a house full of kids and she's speaking at ladies' conferences and she's speaking at ladies' meetings. A bus kid that dared to dream that God could do something special in her life when everybody around her told her it ain't gonna happen. There's no way it's gonna happen. You're not able to, God ain't gonna do that for you. Turn over to Daniel chapter number one. Let me give you another one. Daniel chapter number one. Boy, I love the story of Daniel. What a, what a man of God. But before he became a man of God, he was a young man that walked with God, knew God. He was, just a, he was just a child according to Daniel chapter number one. And in verse number four, he was called, they were called children. Children. Kidnapped away from their family. Taken hostage. Taken to a foreign country with a different language and a different culture and different religions and different gods and different food and different everything. And they got over there and they stuck them all in a room. They put all these Jewish boys over there and they said, now here's what you got to eat and here's what you got to drink. And they looked at the menu and everything on the menu was stuff that was forbidden by their God, Jehovah. The Bible says in verse number eight, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Write this down, number three. They will say you can't decline sinful pleasures. They'll say you can't do that. You gotta eat what we feed you. You gotta drink what we pour you. This is what we want you to have. This is what the king said you gotta eat. This is what everybody else is eating. You have no choice. Daniel said, "Um, I beg to differ. I don't want to eat that. And I don't want to drink that. 
I don't care who all's doing it. I don't care what the rules are. My God said no. I was taught better than that. The Bible says he requested that of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Look at what the prince of the eunuchs said to Daniel in verse number 10. I fear my Lord the king who hath appointed your meat and your drink, for why should he see your face as worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. Daniel said, I don't want to eat that. I don't want to drink that. And the prince of the eunuch says, you ain't got no choice. You have to. You're going to get me killed. You're going to get my head cut off if you don't eat it. David said, Daniel said, I don't want that. I don't want to eat that. I'm declining. Thanks, but no thanks. I'm passing on that. And the prince of the eunuch says, you can't do that. You have to eat it. You have to drink it. Are y'all getting this? There's going to be people in your life that tells you you have to do it because everybody else is doing it. No, you don't. I mean, there's a lot of, let's just be honest right here. A lot of independent Baptists in verse number 11 would have said, okay then. Break me off a piece of that pork roast. Pour me a glass of that fermented wine. If I don't have any choice, I guess I might as well just dig in. God understands the ox is in the ditch. I ain't got no choice. Daniel said, no, no, no. I don't want it. I'm going to pass. I decline on those sinful pleasures. And the prince of the eunuch says, you can't decline. You have to. And Daniel says, no, I do decline. I'm not eating it. What an amazing story. Imagine the amount of peer pressure on these boys. The Bible calls them children. Children. The Bible calls them children in verse number four. Children in whom was no blemish. We don't know how old they were, but they weren't men. They were boys. They could have been y'all's age. I don't know. They could have been young teenagers. They could have been seven, eight, nine, ten. We don't know. But they did one thing that nobody said they could do. They said, I'm not eating that. I'm not doing it. There's going to come a day, listen to me, there's going to come a day when you're going to be off somewhere and somebody's going to hand you a cigarette. And say, here, here, smoke this. And then you look at them with a smile on your face and you say, no, the cigarette's the one smoking. I would be the sucker. bringing all that poison, all that toxins into my body, defiling the temple of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Thanks for no thanks. I don't want it. Yeah. There's going to become a day when somebody's going to hand you a drink and it's going to be alcoholic beverage. It ain't going to be a bottle of Jack Daniels. It never starts out like that. It's going to be some little lemonade, hard, hard seltzer, some kind of, it's going gonna, it's gonna to look, it's gonna look innocent, but it's got a hook in it. It's got a hook in it. And when you drink it and you get that alcohol in your system, you, you get a taste of that buzz, that feeling, and all of a sudden the devil's got a hook in you. And after a while, that hard lemonade and that's, those wine coolers, that ain't going to be good enough. Next thing you're doing, you're drinking beer and you're drinking liquor and you're, and you're getting drunk. And the next thing you do, you're spending your whole paycheck laying in a ditch somewhere, throwing up all over yourself. You know where it started? It started the day that you did not decline sinful pleasures. All these drug overdoses, all these drug overdoses, people overdosing on fentanyl and meth and heroin. You know where it started? You know where it started? 99 times out of 100, it started with a cigarette. Right. Nobody walks out of church and for the first time takes heroin and shoots it into their system. Nobody does that. Nobody snorts crack cocaine off of a coffee table, just cold turkey walking out of Sunday school. No, they start out messing around with all these, all these little, these little doorway drugs, these little, these little, these gateway drugs, cigarettes and marijuana. Oh, it's innocent. It'll make you feel good. Then day's gonna come when that's not gonna do anything for you. I know we ran an addictions ministry here for years. I know how it works. You want to know, do you want to know what Brother Andy Wells told me last night? He, Brother Andy Wells works for the Sheriff's Department down in Monroe. He's a chaplain. You know what he said? He said that the paramedics don't have enough Narcan because all the meth and all the fentanyl dealers have stocked up on it. 
because they're overdosing on their own drugs just about every night and they got a whole stockpile of, of Narcan in their meth labs to help bring each other back from the dead. You know where it started? They didn't decline sinful pleasure. Somebody said, oh, you ain't got no choice. You do have a choice. They told Daniel he didn't have a choice, but he did have a choice. He didn't fall for that lie. You got a choice as well. Turn over to chapter three. Turn over to chapter three. I got to hurry. Chapter three, look at this. Three Hebrew children. Here's three more children. Three Hebrew children. There's an there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, image of gold that's been offered up. Nebuchadnezzar made an image, told everybody they had to bow down and worship it. He said, when you hear the music, when the instruments start playing, you got to fall down, verse number 11. Whosoever falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should not be cast in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. They came to the king and they said in verse number 12, there are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They've not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Write this down. Number four, they will say you can't defy satanic proclamations. This is a satanic proclamation. This is straight out of the pits of hell. A golden image and you got to bow down when the music starts, and they weren't playing Amazing Grace neither. They weren't playing How Great Thou Art. They weren't playing The Love of God. They weren't playing Just As I Am. You know what they was playing? They was playing the devil's music. And when the music started, everybody fell down and started worshiping these golden images, except for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They just stood there. And the people come running up to them and said, you can't do that. You can't stand there like that. You got to get down and you got to bow. And they said, we ain't doing it. They said, you got to. You have to. They said, we're not. We're going to stand right here. They said, you can't stand up. Everybody's got to bow. They said, we're not bowing. And they went and told the king. And the king went and got them and brought them. And they stood before the king. And the Bible says in verse number 13, Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they brought these men before the king. And he said, is it true? Verse 14, do you not serve my gods nor worship the golden image which I've set up? Verse number 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, O Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful to answer thee in this matter. That's King James 4. We're not the least bit nervous right now to tell you we are not following your proclamation. We're not doing it. Look at what it says in the next verse. Verse 17, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. We defy, we defy, we openly defy your satanic proclamation. We are not doing it. They said, you have to. Are we going to throw you in that burning, fire, fiery furnace? They said, well, you just go right on ahead and throw us in there. And our God might deliver us. And again, he might not. I don't care. We don't know what God's going to do, but we know what we're not going to do. We are not going to bow down to that image right there. There's always going to be people around you say, you can't. You can't. You can't. You can't. You can't defy satanic proclamations. You just got to go along with it. No you do not. And guess what happened? They threw him in the fiery furnace just like they promised. And guess what happened? The men that threw them in died from the heat. It was so hot because he heated it up seven times hotter than it was before. And they got in there and I believe old Shadrach said, I don't know about y'all, I feel a little, feel a little draft in here. I feel, a little, I feel a little cool air blowing through here. I said, look at that, our ropes just burn off. The Bible says they were walking around in that fiery furnace and the form of the fourth was like unto the Son of God. And God came down and walked around in that fire with them. The Bible says they came out of that fire at the end of this chapter. They came, they got them out of the fire and the Bible says their clothes didn't even smell like smoke. That's amazing. You can't get within 15 feet of a fire pit but you don't smell like you've been to hell and back. These guys were in that fiery furnace and didn't have the smell of smoke on them. And you know what the king said? The king said, um, let's scratch that proclamation. We're all, we're all going to serve their God. Amen. That's what happens when you don't listen to them when they tell you you can't. Look over at John chapter number six. John chapter number six. We're moving along here pretty good. John chapter number six. We find a story here. 
5,000 people on the side of a hill. Jesus is up there preaching. Jesus is up there talking. Jesus is up there telling stories. Jesus is up there giving parables. Jesus is up there doing what Jesus does. And they lost track of time. One of the disciples, he looked at his watch. He said, Lord, it's, it's the, we've, done, we've just sat out here all the way through lunch, and now here it is almost supper time. And Jesus said, well, I think we ought to do something for all these people. They look hungry. And they said, Lord, we, we don't have enough money to feed all these people. But those little boys standing right there overheard this conversation. And you know what he said? I got lunch. I got five loaves and two fishes. I could give that. And the disciples, being the knuckleheads that they were, they looked at him, and the Bible says this. They looked at him and said, what are they? Talking about the five loaves and two fishes. What are they among so many? The little boy said, I want to try to solve the problem here. I want to try to be a blessing. I want to try to help fix the problem. And you know what they said to him? You can't. You're too little. You don't have enough. Am I still in the book? Yeah. Chapter number six and verse number nine. There's a lad here which had five loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? Write this down. They will say you can't donate significant provisions. You're too little. Your offering is too little. That, that little bit of money that you've been putting in the plate for missions, there'll be people say that ain't enough to even fool with. Just keep it. Come on now. There'll be people look at you and say, won't you let the big people, the ones that's got the big jobs, driving the nice cars and the nice house, won't you let them support the missions and you just hang on to your little change and you hang on to your little $1 bills, you just go put that back in your piggy bank and you can save that one day, you can go buy you some ice cream or something at Rita's. And you say, but God's laid it on my heart. God's burdened my heart to give what I've got. I don't have a job. I don't have a regular paycheck. I don't have no way to go make no money. But every now and then I get a little bit of money from my grandma for my birthday. Every now and then I get a little bit of money from mom and dad if I help them with some things. I, I got some money. And you preachers been preaching about tithing. And the preachers been over preaching about we need to get the gospel around the world. And God begins to deal with your heart. And God begins to lay it on your heart to give and to give sacrificially to try to make a difference. And somebody's going to look at you and say, that ain't enough money to even fool with. Just keep it. Let me tell you something right now. God can do more with five loaves and two fishes than you can imagine if you'll just give it. I wish to have time enough to tell you story after story after story after story of things I've experienced in my own life where God laid things on my heart, even as a child, to give. And everybody around me probably thought it was silly, but it was real to me. And guess what God did at an early age? At an early age, God taught me this. You cannot outgive God. Amen. And they fed all those people, 5,000 plus people, then they gathered up all the fragments and they picked up 12 baskets, 12 baskets of leftovers. And don't you think for one second that each one of those stupid disciples got any of it. No, they were the ones making fun of the little boy. They were the ones saying, well, I ain't enough to do anything with. I believe Jesus said, y'all pick all these leftovers up. I don't want all of y'all to grab a basket. Arch, right, don't you follow that boy back to his house. He's going to take that home with him. Yeah. I believe that because that's what the Bible says. Right. The give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over shall men give unto your bosom. Yeah. And I learned at an early age that if you just be obedient with your offering, I don't care if it's five cents, I don't care if it's five dollars, don't you let nobody make you think that that offering is little and it's insignificant because if God told you to give it, you just give it. Amen. You just give it. Right. One of these days, God's going to let you have a job. One of these days, he's going to let you make more money than you could imagine. And you know what you're going to already have figured out? The more you give, the more you get. Yeah. Go ahead and learn that lesson now. Don't say nothing. Shh. Don't say nothing. But we got grown-ups in here that ain't figured that out yet. Yeah. They won't tithe. They have a job. They get a paycheck every week. And every week is pretty much the same exact thing to the penny. And they act like it's the last check they're ever going to get. And they still ain't learned to tithe because they don't trust God with their giving. Yeah. And by their very example, 
by their example. Here's what they're saying to you kids. You can't, you can't trust God neither. Don't listen to them. They're robbing God and they're missing out. They're robbing their own self. Now don't, t- don't let them know I told y'all that. Don't let them know I told you that. They'll get mad at me and they, well, they can't quit giving because they already ain't. I got time for one more. Look over at Luke chapter number two. Back up Luke chapter number two. They'll say you can't donate significant provisions. Oh my goodness, God can do more with your dollar. God can do more with your five dollars to get the gospel around the world. There ain't no telling how many gospel tracts five dollar bill will buy. There's no telling. And if I had my good friend here from down in South Carolina, remember my, my good buddy, Brother Gary Gwynn, he got up here and talked about the pennies, but talked about all the pennies and all the tracks that they printed with those pennies. And he says every day he goes to the church and there's change laying up on the porch. People go by and throw change. They throw pennies and nickels up there and he just buys all kind of tracks and paper with those pennies. You, you don't even know how many people could get saved from a penny, from a dollar. If God said give it, you just give it. Don't worry about, don't worry about, hey, listen to me. Learn this early. It's just money. There's more where that came from. Learn that early. It's just money. It's just money. There's more where that came from. You say, well, if I give all this money, I ain't ever going to have any more money. Yeah, you will. There's more money out there. There's a lot more money out there. There's all kind of money out there. Don't worry about it. Number, number next, we find Jesus at the age of 12. How many 12-year-olds we got over here? If you're 12, raise your hand. Xander? Ayler? Look at you. We got some 12 year olds right here. Look at this. Look at this. Won't you look at this? Luke chapter number Luke chapter number two. Y'all gonna love this one. Y'all gonna love this one right here. The Bible says that Moses, Joseph and Mary supposed that he had been in the company. They went off and left Jesus in verse number 44. They went a day's journey. They left Jesus in Jerusalem. They went a day, they went a whole day's journey. I, was, I got up early Monday, Monday morning. I got up early. I never went to bed. I never went to sleep. I just laid there and tossed and turned about 2.30. I said, forget this. And I just went and got in the truck and I left. And I went somewhere and I stopped, stopped to use the restroom. And I got in my truck, started down the road. And my Bluetooth says, phone disconnected. It's like, I left my phone in that bathroom at that gas station with all my money and all my credit cards. <laughs> I pulled up in there, slammed on brakes. I went running in the door, went running up that bathroom. There was my phone laying right there. I said, thank you, Lord. But they left their son. (laughs) They left Jesus. They was gone all day before they realized he ain't here. They thought he was with all the kinfolk. He's not there. So now they had to go a whole day's journey back. And then they spent a whole day looking for him. For three days, he's been by himself, unsupervised. Guess what he was doing when they found him? Standing out in the middle of the road throwing rocks at cars? No. Was he hanging from the overpass with spray, spray paint, writing his girlfriend's name on the spray paint? Say it with Krylon. Is that what he was doing? No. Look at what he was doing. The Bible says it came to pass, verse 46, that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions, and all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers, and when they saw him, they were amazed. Write this down, number seven, number six. They will say, you can't discuss scriptural precepts at your age. You're too little to have a conversation with us about the Bible. Um, I beg to differ. 12 years old. He's sitting right in the middle of all of these doctors, all of these theologians that have been studying the law for years and years. And Jesus sitting there as a 12 year old boy and he said, I got a question. And they probably the first time looked at him and said, what are you even doing here? Ain't you supposed to be outside playing? That's what adults say when, they, when you start getting on our nerves. They're saying, ain't you supposed to be outside playing? And he said, I got a question. I got, I got a question. 
Over there in, in, in Zephaniah, over there in Malachi, over there in Joel, over there in Daniel, over there in Isaiah. What do you, what do you suppose this statement means? And they all looked at one another and said, oh my goodness. Little kid right here just asked us a question. We don't know the answer. And they're all looking at one another and they're all sitting there. And, and Jesus, being God, but still being a 12-year-old boy with limited understanding. Listen to me. The last verse in Luke 2 says that he increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. He had to learn just like everybody else did. But at the age of 12, he had already spent so much time in the scrolls that he said, well, you know what I think that verse means? I think it means this right here. And they all looked at one another and said, you're not able to know that. Ain't no way you can know that. There is no way at your age that you can know that much about the Bible. Come on now. Am I still in the book? Amen. They were shocked and amazed because he wasn't supposed to be able to do that. That wasn't normal. What am I saying? I'm saying this. There's going to come a time in your life when there's going to be an interest. I hope this is true some of you. There's going to be an interest about spiritual things. There's going to be an interest about deep biblical truths. Let me tell you where to figure that out, where to learn that. In the Bible, in the Bible, you're going to find the answer. In the Bible, A, and you're going to find it hanging out with people that study the Bible. Amen. You're not going to find it on Xbox. Amen. I promise you, I absolutely guarantee you that anybody playing Xbox has never gotten up a Bible message to preach or a Sunday school lesson to teach playing Nintendo or Xbox or PlayStation or whatever in the Sam Hill it's called now. It was Atari when I was a kid. It was Atari, Pac-Man and Donkey Kong. I lived before video games. Can you believe that? I remember when Pac-Man came out. It was fascinating. Look at him eating all them dots. <laughs> Just stare at it for hours. Man, and after about two days, I was like, is that all it does? I was bored. I'd rather go and sit at the table with all the preachers yeah. sitting around talking about seed thought. Yeah. Can I tell you, can I tell you this to me? I'm done. Listen to me. They're going to say that you're too little and too young to have a substantial conversation and discussion about the Bible. I'm going to tell you how to knock that rumor in the head. Have something substantial to say. I'm going to tell you, you're in a place right now. Boys, listen to me. Y'all are in a place right now. If we were sitting in yonder at the table after a potluck or after a cereal celebration and, and me and Brother Bittner and Brother Sasser, we're all sitting around and we're just kicking ideas around about Bible verses and we're talking about little seed thoughts and little messages and, and I preached this the other day and I preached that and well, I saw this verse. And one of y'all, one of you 12-year-olds was to say, preacher, can I say something? I'd say, sure, what is it? And you say, I was reading my Bible this morning and I was reading this verse and I didn't understand what it meant. And I prayed and asked the Lord to tell me what it meant. And I got to study in that verse. And this is what I got out of that verse. And then you used to share that with us. Every one of us at that table would say, my soul, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Good night, son. Yeah. That's wonderful. Amen. Well, I wish I'd have thought of that. I, can, I know what I'd say. I'm preaching that. <laughs> and I'm going to make them think I got it. There ain't one of us in here who look at you and say, you're not able to do that. There ain't a one of us in here tonight, I'm done. There ain't a one of us in here tonight that would say you're not able to do any of those six things right there. Not a one of us. Now the whole rest of the world will. Everybody out there will tell you you can't. But you can. Because God said, here's what God's word said, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. If 12 year old Jesus can do it, and by the way, Nearly every one of those, with the exception of the three Hebrew children, nearly every one of them, they did what they did by their self. It wasn't a crowd. Because it's not going to just be the big people and the old people telling you you can't. It's going to be all the friends your age looking at you saying, you can't do that. But you can. Your life's going to be filled with Saul's saying, you're not able. And you know what you do? You say, I love you and I appreciate you. I need you to move out of the way. Because what you just told me I can't do, I'm fixing to do it. I'm fixing to do it. And David ran down there to that giant and cut his head off, and he delivered Israel from the Philistines after a king looked him in the face and said, you're not able to do it. He did do it. He was able. And you're able to do it with God's help. 
Here's the question with your heads bowed and eyes closed. Sister Hannah's coming to the piano. Here's the invitation. Here's the invitation right here. How many of you are willing to get an altar and say, I'm not going to listen to the naysayers. I'm not going to listen to the ones that try to discourage me, tell me I can't live for God. I'm not going to listen to the ones that tell me that I've got too many things, too many strikes against me. I come from the wrong family. My mama did this and my daddy did this and I had this home and I had this situation and I, and I, and I got this and I got that I, and I'll never be able to do anything for God. You need to get an altar tonight and say, you know what, with God's help, I'm not going to listen to all those people that tell me I can't. And I'm listening to God tells me I can. We need some adults down here. We need some mamas and daddies down here because that message tonight was everybody in here. There's some of y'all in here. Your family tells you you cannot live for God. You will never be able to overcome this. You'll never be able to get away from this. You'll never be able to get around this. Let me tell you something tonight. With God's help, you can. You can. 